Hello, I'm Josephine Cafania and welcome to this session. I'd also like to welcome Craig Foster, a special guest who needs barely any introduction. He, of course, is a former Socceroo, he's a sports analyst for SBS, an outspoken advocate and the force behind the volunteering initiative Play for Lives. Welcome to this session and thank you for your time, Craig. That's okay, Josephine. Lovely to see you and it's good to be here. First up, you must be pleased to hear that we've now had a loosening up of the rules covering sports training. Yes, I'm pleased. I think the most important thing is that, uh, you know, the safety of, of the athletes, of uh, the team members uh, and of general society, you know, and public health is by far the most important aspect. I, I think uh, sport uh, didn't start from that perspective. You know, the, the commercial economic forces on uh, Australian sport and indeed global sport are so vast at the moment, particularly broadcasting agreements and others, that you know, for some of the professional sporting competitions, their very survival was predicated on getting back to play as soon as possible. But I'm pleased to see that the major sports have uh, at least collaborated and worked with the chief medical officers of the states and I think uh, also nationally to make sure that a sane approach is being taken. I hope that for all of us, you know, and that includes sport, because sport is a highly visible social institution, you know, if sport's gonna go back to play, you know, in inverted commas, you know, we need to make sure we do it in a way that um, communicates to the rest of Australia and globally that, you know, safety is by far the most important priority here. So let's hope that we can uh, continue to flatten the curve. Now, your initiative, of course, has, has filled the gap for uh, many sports people who, well, might be looking for things to do, but also realising that the community needs assistance, that there are gaps to fill at this time. Tell us a bit about why you started this initiative and was it difficult? It wasn't difficult. It was really quite straightforward. Uh, the, the reason was simply because Australia and I think uh, other countries as well needed sport at this time. And for well, there are many reasons. Another one is because it's important for sport to fulfil its social responsibility. And the third one was because sport's initial reaction, which was kind of uh, typical really, was to say, look, we need to keep playing in order to keep people entertained. Uh, but, you know, I, being part of the football community, I was well aware of what had happened abroad. We'd have a, had a huge amount uh, of sports people, of course, in countries, whether it was in China or USA or indeed Italy, where football, my game, was particularly and uh, horribly um, affected. And, you know, we knew uh, the severity of this virus was going to necessitate um, the cessation of sport. And so the, the first reaction was, well, then let's help Australia rather than playing. Let's put ourselves at the service of the Australian community. Then it became a question of how to do that. Uh, and that was about simply, you know, some messaging, a bit of a platform to allow sport and charities to connect, uh, which with every volunteering organisation around the country, of course, knows is really important. Uh, and then, you know, getting uh, sports active and, and just telling that story um, and encouraging sports people who are, you know, highly compassionate, community minded people, uh, encourage them to get involved and giving them some tools and a way to do so. Was the first step gathering the participants to, to join or was it the connections with those charitable organisations? It was both because in a crisis, uh, you know, a pandemic like this, things move very quickly and help was needed immediately. I'm already, you know, kind of uh, very close to the social services sector. I work with Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and others and refugee and asylum seekers. So I was already acutely aware of the growing need of vulnerable communities. So I knew that that was going to ra very rapidly expand. At the same time, some of those charities I could see were already losing some elderly Australians as the volunteer workforce. And they were starting to say, look, um, you know, and when I started those discussions around, well, look, we're just about to stop sport. And we have this, you know, millions of Australians really, who are in this kind of age demographic um, where, you know, they're capable of, of filling these really important roles. Um, you know, it became clear also that all the organisations, Meals on Wheels or Cancer Council, all these actually wanted to be able to say to the elderly Australians, don't feel guilty, we want you to be able to stay at home, we want to look after mm -hmm. you. 
And it was an opportunity to kind of say to Elderly Australia, just as one example, look, you know, we're happy to step in for you now. Uh, and you guys, please stay at home. We're doing it to help you. We want you guys to be safe. And as that kind of, you know, that dynamic started to evolve, it became very clear that in actual fact, all of us were required to do something. Uh, and this, it, it, I think finally also, Josephine, was an opportunity to really distill and talk about and, and live these values of civic duty and, you know, and social responsibility. And my personal feeling has been that sport has moved away from that a lot in this kind of in recent decades, all about the professional game, not so much about community grassroots sport. And sporting communities in every council area around the country are incredibly important social connectors. And this was a chance to get them back in action and, and making new connections. So at a time when we're saying, you know, social distancing, self-isolation, you know, stay at home, uh, sport is a vehicle that can actually create new connections by reaching out to homeless communities, to refugees, asylum seekers, and uh, to, you know, all of the, you know, unfortunate people who've lost their employment during this time. It's almost like a remade workforce, isn't it, really, especially in downtime? It is. Um, you know, there was some great research to come out of Christchurch. One of the people I spoke to uh, right at the beginning of this pandemic was the former a chairperson of uh, Rugby New Zealand, actually, the All Blacks and others. And he said, David Crawford um, is his name, and he said uh, that the research was saying that community organisations, including sport, not exclusive, but certainly a really important cohort of that, uh, these community organisations played an immensely important role in picking up the pieces after that Christchurch earthquake, or indeed any disaster. And that means, it's these social connections at very grassroots level and community level, the ones that I grew up with, you know, people who, you know, when my father was volunteering, you know, to, in my local football club, you know, they used to have the working bees and they would build, uh, you know, clubhouses and all these things, or it was their volunteer time they gave as chair, chair people or a presidents of the local associations or organizations, whatever it was, those connections are, are some of the most important that we've ever built in any society. It's where trust is, is developed. Um, it's where we, we learn to, to work together in groups. It's where we also cross cultural and faith boundaries. It's where everyone comes together in these times and builds new social connections and understanding. So for all of those reasons, it was a great opportunity to get sport involved and perhaps, and I hope, to get sport to learn a little bit more about parts of uh, society. And is it, are you optimistic about that continuing on the other side of this pandemic? I am. Um, I think just on the very basis that, uh, you know, sport has been able to get a better understanding of parts of the community who already were vulnerable and they can see actually what's occurring to them every day. And of course, these are people who NGOs and charity organisations around the country predominantly are already working with actively, uh, you know, and doing a fabulous job. But if sport gets a better understanding of that, then, you know, Australia and the world can only be a better place. But equally, at the same time, we've been able to create some partnerships. Um, you know, Football Federation Australia with Red Cross is a really great example. That's kind of the first, uh, you know, set of meetings that I set up some months ago. And that's an opportunity for that to be to endure uh, and to grow and evolve because, you know, that sport alone, my sport alone has around 2 million participants. So you can scale messages and you can, uh, you know, bring, bring athletes in as well as governing bodies. So we've seen here at Addison Road Community Centre, where I am at the moment, uh, where I've been almost every morning for the last couple of months, uh, you know, packing food boxes. You know, we've had a bunch of the swans down here and we've had off between 15 and 20 local sporting clubs having, um, you know, some of their participants, coaches and others volunteering here. That can only be good. That sounds terrific. So specifically, how many volunteers have put their hand up from, from sporting clubs and, um, and stars, if you like, but also what are the sorts of things that they've said to you that, that they feel this may have changed their attitudes as well? Well, look, we've had thousands of people involved. As the actual number, I don't know, and nor was I really 
uh, that, that interest in doing so. I just want to see people helping in a whole heap of different ways. So many of the charities and organisations have registered on playforlives.org, as has many player associations, clubs, all around the country from grassroots to professional level. Uh, but equally, uh, you know, the Play for Lives is a movement, not just a platform. And we've enc we're encouraging sport to just help out wherever they can. And so we're seeing projects spring up all around the place to help women's refuges, um, you know, to provide whatever it is that they need, um, both here in Sydney and Melbourne, for instance, with Variety, a children's charity. You know, some of that support is digital, you know, providing Zoom chats and all of these type of things. Mm. Uh, organisations and sporting clubs in Brisbane are helping to feed over 600 international students and migrants and others. So the response from the people who are actually doing so has been really wonderful. Um, you know, here at Addison Road Community Centre in Marrickville, where I've been for a long time, it's been really special because it's kind of become a bit of a sanctuary of people uh, getting together at a time when, you know, we've been socially isolated. Uh, but also just enjoying um, being able to give. And mm. in a time, one of the really powerful parts of this has been that in sport, like every part of society, we don't often get time to pause. And, you know, in, the, in football, for instance, footballers and clubs would be lucky to get four weeks off a year. And when that happens, people predominantly will go in their teams or they'll go off and, and have a holiday, whatever. Very rarely do they have an opportunity to spend a month or more just operating in a different sector of society and getting to meet or, or deliver food to people uh, you know from refugee you know Hazara and Karen uh, refugees or you know homeless people in a whole range of organizations around in the inner west here or cancer patients and others and so it's been an opportunity for many people in sport to get a very different perspective on um, you know, where society is, um, to, to, you know, many talk about this concept of gratitude, of course, and reflection, you know, how fortunate they feel, but I'm hoping that it's about much more than that. It's not just enough to say, and this is what I say to them. That's great. That's the first step is to say, look, all of these people need help. And I didn't really know they were there and it's expanding, but you know, I didn't know these, that this was them, this many homeless, you know, I'm so focused on my sport and I have a really powerful social voice. You know, I can influence people. So now you're getting to understand. And what I say to them is, yeah, that's wonderful. That's step one. Step two is what are you going to do about it? So you can, you know, so by volunteering, you can become much more aware of these social issues. So can you help out? There's many ways to help out. And you might even start to raise your voice on these particular issues. And, in, and by so doing, you can bring sport, you know, you can, you can create a different movement in sport. And that is sport for society, sport and its social responsibility. And that's something I talk a lot about is sport runs social programs. Let's say, for instance, uh, sport runs a social program with a big issue around homelessness. That's wonderful because you're providing visibility and we all get asked to be ambassadors of everything, of course. You're providing visibility. You're allowing different discussions to happen. You've got people who are kind of, you know, following you, if you like, for want of a better term. And you're letting them see a different part of society. And that's all fine. But what would be better is if sport actually raised its voice against homelessness. That's the ultimate plan. The ultimate, you know, the ultimate goal is for sport as a major social institution to say, well, we, we feel strongly that um, we're, as part of a society's fabric, we think that we need to speak up on these, on these social inequities. And we, we can actually, you know, make a substantive impact here. And that's where I'd like to see sport head. So, in a sense, you've started a movement, but what you're saying is you want more than that. You want sport to pick up a different role on top of that, but to speak out and be, well, outspoken advocates like yourself. Now, is that too much to ask? Because, as we know, professional sporting clubs don't like to get political. Well, I'm not, I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about human rights, yeah. And that's exactly the question that often happens, right? So, well, what sport does is say, well, look, we're getting some government funding. So, you know, we have some sensitivity here around, you know, some of these mm -hmm. issues. Well, why do you? We're just talking about human beings. So, to me, it's all about reframing those discussions. Uh, you know, asylum seekers and refugees are a really great example. Every country has a specific policy around that. But if you advocate for the human rights of everyone and the human rights of refugees uh, to seek asylum, 
um, that you're talking about human beings. You're talking about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's not only about the present Australian government. And in fact, you can talk about that and frame it in a way where you're not attacking the government. You're just talking about, um, you know, the rights of all of us. See, sport has a responsibility to do so. Why? It's because sport is about team. It's about equality. Um, it, it's about the rights of everyone. It's about opportunity. It's about all of these concepts that we talk about a lot. But then when it comes to people who are being harmed or in different positions in society, even though some of them we sit on the bench and we play sport with, for some reason, and we say, we're going to protect you. And, you know, we're going to play sport with you and we love you. You're one of us. We're all together, as we keep saying in Australia. Then when some of, you know, that same community are in trouble, sports says, oh, but we don't want to speak about those people. And, and that's what I think we need to resolve that kind of um, a dissonance. So it's time for, you know, athletes do this quite well. You know, athletes, uh, you know, have a, a social voice and, and we see quite a few athlete advocates. But I think sport, like business today, you're starting to see the rise of business activism. Right, this new generation of business leaders coming through, which I really love. What they're saying is, you know, we're going to stand up for what we believe in. And one of the reasons is they say that their employees, the younger generation of employees, expect it. They want to see a purpose led company. They want to work for someone that stands for something and does the right thing, not just for their own family, but for society. And I think sport has to take the same route. And I'm hopeful that the next generation of athletes are going to say the same thing. I'm going to play for a sporting club here in AFL or football or basketball, and I expect you to stand up for refugees and asylum seekers. That would be a great step forward. Can I take you back to the role of the volunteer in sport? Mm -hmm. And as you would know, and every, anyone who's parents through the professional players know that the role of a volunteer in clubs is quite crucial and many of them would collapse without uh, their assistance. But what you're doing goes further than that. It's now the sports person who's giving back, who's, who the, who's the one that's volunteering in a sense. Mm. Yes, and um, so what sport typically does, you know, what you saw a lot of the professional clubs do throughout this pandemic was really great. Um, but it's kind of like the first step, you know, mm -hmm. so if we just talk professional for a moment. So professional sports says, well, look, we need a response to this, like any employer or, or social institution that wants to help. So what they typically do is help their players and their staff, which of course is normal, and then they help their members. So some of the professional clubs said, well, we're going to do the, you know, we're going to do Zoom calls or we're going to deliver meals to our elderly members or other members. And what I say to sport is, well, why is that? Why do you stop there? Sport is an important social institution. And one reason why the government supports you, one reason why um, uh, our sponsors and commercial interests want to uh, become partners with you is not only just for your fans, it's for the broader society. That's why they put the money in. It's because all of the country is watching, even if they're not buying shirts and so on. You're in a very important, influential social institution. So don't stop there. You actually have a responsibility to help the rest of society. So go and help all the elderly in your community to the extent that you can. Go and find new communities to help, and that's important. When it comes to grassroots community support, of course, that's been built on volunteerism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to make sure that that continues. So by... You know, we're doing two things. We're, we're, we're saying to those in sport, you have a responsibility to everyone in society. And at the mm. same time, we're holding up those who are volunteering. And by the way, this is digital and physical, of course. Mm. Um, we're, we're holding up all of those who are giving their time, um, you know, as emblems, if you like, to say that's what sport in essence is about. It's a professional level, but at community grassroots takes great people who want to build these institutions that help kids and others integrate into society. And how good is Australia at doing that compared to the rest of the world? Oh, that's, a, that's probably a question for you and the experts in the volunteer field. Mm -hmm. um, look, I think traditionally, historically, or my personal view anecdotally is that when I grew up, volunteerism was a really huge part mm -hmm. of um, the social experience. You know, I mean, my, my parents, in particular my father, has volunteered for anything and everything forever. 
so you know he was the president of the cricket club and he's president of the orchid club and uh you know and and he used to go i remember in our local football club slash soccer we used you know they had to do some new fields and build a little clubhouse and so all of the parents went up and they actually built this thing you know they raised the money they put the stuff in and they built these things and that's what it was about so many of those stories around yeah. every community has one Oh, totally. And, and that's, you know, that's what local community is about. You know, I, 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 I hope that one of the things through this pandemic, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and, and I could say semi-confident, is that we've revitalised this concept of civic duty. And that means that we all spend, well, maybe too much time. You know, a lot of people are reflecting on their, their life-work balance at the moment, which is another really good outcome. But uh, equally, we're saying, look, this is our work and our home life, but we also have a responsibility to broader society. And if we can all uh, express that through our local community, Australia and the world, but Australia would be a far better place. You know, our local community is where we can volunteer for any number of things to help people, to help the council, to help the sporting club, um, and to make sure that people who don't have the opportunities we have uh, can have a better opportunity better chance in life and and get through and and craig are you just just to wind it up are you optimistic about that future and of course playing for lives looks like it might be a permanent thing yeah let's see look um you know i i kind of didn't really set it up in that way you know it's just a loose coalition of, of mm -hmm. sporting clubs and people around the country you know it started with a hashtag and it became playforlives.org right which was just to connect the two and also mm -hmm. to be able to measure the social impact by sport which was really important for sport to be after this to be able to have a story to tell about how they helped and to be able to show that in a in a evidence-based way so, you know, some of these relationships in, undoubtedly are enduring. You know, I've seen just here people who come, have fallen in love with the people, with the environment, with the concept of giving and giving back, and that's really important. And let's see where we can take that in future. It can only be good. Well, uh, Craig, congratulations on the efforts so far, and I wish you well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Josephine. My pleasure.